Welcome to Fit and Chips Chats. This is a podcast for women over 40 who are looking for sane and frank advice about their health and wellness, especially through menopause. I'm Amanda Thebe, the original resilient bitch and menopause guru. In my work as a personal trainer and nutrition coach, And through my own personal experience, it became obvious to me information about menopause and this curious phase of our life was so ridiculously hard to find. And that's why I started this podcast. Join me every week as I speak to health and wellness experts on hot topics that directly impact you. I've made it my mission to help you by exploding a few myths, presenting you with the facts and hoping to inspire you to be a healthy, strong person just like me. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review. Then go and tell your friends and then go and tell your husband and then tell the neighbor. And then don't forget to visit me at fitandchips.com. And now let's get started on today's show. Welcome back to this week's episode of Fit and Chips Chat. I have Dr. Roseanne Woods on the show with me today. I'm very excited that we've connected and we met on Instagram and Roseanne reached out to me because she's from a similar background to me, but then she's just done this kick-ass thing and just done this massive research paper and become a doctor in the meantime. But the research paper was all about menopause. And I just want to say hello and let's just talk about it now, Roseanne, because it's going to be a really great conversation. Welcome onto the show. Thanks for having me. Based in Alberta, Canada, I've just found out. So is it cold there right now? Uh, It's not bad. It's about minus six Celsius. So Oh my God, I don't even remember what that's like. Being in Texas, it's now 10 degrees Celsius today and people are like dying of the cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the paper that you wrote, along with other people, I'll mention that it wasn't Ros- Roseanne, it, the research was with the team, right? Well, they were my dissertation advisors, so advisor, they have yeah. credit for the editing, yeah. The, oh, it's okay. That makes sense then. Well, the paper was on lean body mass in menopause and how that affects menopause symptoms. So before we start talking about that specifically, I sort of want to know why, why you wanted, why you felt the urge to write this paper. I'm so happy that you did, <laughs> but let's just find out what your story is. That would be really interesting. Well, it was kind of, you know, observational. So I would be at the gym and, you know, all my peers are there and the cardio bunnies, you know, they're very fit and they're very lean, but a lot of them were having hot flashes and myself and some of the others who had been strength training for years and years weren't having hot flashes. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting connection and so I thought I wanted to dig a little deeper into it and so I started looking at what the research was and the only research out there um, specifically with hot flashes is with regard to body fat so they've looked at BMI they've looked at body fat percentage they've looked at waist size but nobody had looked at the connection between lean body mass and and hot flashes or or cold night sweats which was also something we looked at So um, there was a massive study done in the United States called the Study of Women's Health Across the Nation. It started in 1996, and they recruited 3,300 women, and they have followed them for 15 years. So they have massive amounts of data. And starting at visit six, which would have been about 2002, they started collecting data through bioelectrical impedance. So we have 2,300 women who were followed for five years and had bioelectrical impedance measurements done. So Roseanne, can you just explain exactly what that is for people listening who don't understand? Sure. So bioelectrical impedance sends a charge through your body and it will measure the amount of skeletal muscle mass, your total body water, your total body fat. And there are calculations they use that can then bring that all back into, say, kilograms of skeletal muscle and kilograms of body fat. So it, it's like uh, having an MRI of your total body that gives you a, a specific body measurements. And so. it's, it's pretty accurate, right? As far as data goes, that's one of the more accurate ways of measuring that, right? Yes, especially in a clinical setting, which was, you know, they uh, hold constant all the parameters, like who's doing it, how they're doing it, the calculations that are being used, the the metrics that are being used are all, and they calibrate the machines they use so that it's, it's 
very, very well controlled in these studies. So, and in 2016, there was a study done that showed that uh, bioelectrical impedance is accurate for menopausal women because there was some issue with the amount of belly fat that women carry at that age that it would maybe not be accurate, but that was in fact proven not true. So going back to this mass data that you have, what was significant about the 23,000 number of women? The 2,300 women. 2,300. Oh, yeah, just took an extra zero on. I, believe menop- I bring my menopause for every mistake I make. Damn you. <laughs> 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 Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so 2,300 uh, is... Most studies aren't able to follow this massive number of women, and it was done in uh, seven different locations across the U.S. So it was done in Oakland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New Jersey, Michigan, uh, and they had... Uh, five different ethnic groups represented. So oftentimes in these types of studies, you know, it's it's all Caucasian women or it's, you know, the, this one had Asian women, Latina women, uh, African-Americans and Caucasians. So they were able to right. um, really get a good look across the whole spectrum, which has always been an issue. So being able to follow these women for 15 years has been amazing. Wow. I love that. And I love the fact that like it, the focus isn't just on the, the, the middle-aged white female. It drives me crazy because <laughs> many of the people listening to this are from diff- different ethnic backgrounds and they just don't even feel, they, we don't feel represented in menopause. So they definitely don't feel represented, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So we know that this mass study happened and you know that you're, you're seeing all of these cardio bunnies in the gym. They're usually very slim ladies as well, but they're really struggling with um, these. It's called VMS, but if we just talk about them as like hot flashes specifically, yeah. what what findings did you have from from all of that data? Well, it, it was so great. I was so happy because what we found was um, women who maintained higher levels of lean body mass through the five years were up to 70% less likely to experience uh, hot flashes. So on a year-by-year specific basis, we didn't see significant differences between the groups. Um, But once we looked at the range over time, it became very significant. So the probability of uh, having hot flashes goes down significantly the higher your lean body mass. And lean Body mass, if for, for those listening as well, we can talk about that as as muscle, right? We can talk about that like muscle versus like fat, because we we know we know that especially women who are in the obese range, they're more likely than any other person to have more severe symptoms, right? We know that there's a direct correlation with the, the body fat. So, oh my gosh, where to go from here? There's so many exciting questions. So, um. How did you know that it was specifically strength resistance training that was helping the women as opposed to like the traditional HIIT exercises? I know that there was some um, information about that within the study. Well, my study wasn't able to examine that specifically because um, although the women were supposed to and were alleged to have filled out the Kaiser Physical Activity Questionnaire, which is a uh, questionnaire that the research community uses to gauge uh, your type of activity and the minutes of activity and all that type of stuff, and the women did fill that out, (coughs) excuse me, but the information was taken down from the website. It's being cleaned, as they like to say in the research world. So we weren't able to look at the difference in the activity levels of the women. But we, the research just in general, um, I did, was showing a significant uh, difference between women who resistance train and the um, level of symptoms they were experiencing versus those who were just doing uh, moderate cardio, which prior to about 2014, the only studies that were done um, intervention wise, where you would, you know, take two groups and one group would do uh, exercise and the other group would not, and you compare them at the end. The group doing the exercise was given walking exercises to do, which we know movement is very, very important for stress levels in menopausal women. But in terms of, you know, increasing their strength levels or increasing their muscle mass, that wasn't what they were measuring at all. 
Yeah, well, we know that there, there just isn't enough muscle stimulus. And I think that's where it comes down to it, right? We know that like the, the general moderate cardio is, is good for general health benefits. And we understand that. But the, there's the, it's very difficult to stimulate the muscles at a particular level in order to generate any muscle growth, right? And yeah. um, I know from personal experience that I actually have, a, like I would consider a no, normal lean body mass, um, normal to low probably because I, I do re- resistance train and I have most of my life. And although menopause gave me a little bit of weight gain, it wasn't significant enough to change that lean body mass enough. Um, yeah. And I one of the symptoms I haven't experienced at all, and I think about them all, is, is hot flashes. The, it just hasn't been an issue. Um, and I often wondered why. I mean, I did have them for, a, for I think, for about three, week, three weeks. They came, they killed me, they went, they've never come back. I don't really know what happened. It's a little bit of an, uh, an anomaly, it feels to me. Mm-hmm. But I knew for those three weeks I had them, I was like, holy shit. They're awful. They're really awful. Um, so, but from a personal perspective, I, my my personal empirical da- data meets your like um, your conclusions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, what does that mean, though? What does that mean for somebody in your vision now? They're in menopause. They may be in perimenopause. They may be postmenopausal. You know, they don't know where they are. Yeah. Like, but they're symptomatic. What What were the recommendations at the end of the study? Uh, well, for women in general, we need to get out to women who are in their mid thirties and be pounding this drum and saying, you have got to lift heavy weights because this is going to make your life so much easier in 10 or 15 years. And I know that's a hard story for people to hear, and it's it's a hard prescription to give them. But if if we don't start getting – and I think, interestingly, the, the women in the study, when they started in 1996, they were already between 42 and 52. And they, you know, were growing up in an era where you did Jane Fonda aerobics and nobody was telling them to lift weights. So they didn't have that cultural shift. Right now, I would say we have much more of a cultural shift where our younger women are in the gym, they're doing CrossFit, they're lifting heavy, they're, and they're okay with that. And, you know, society is okay with women having muscles now. So there's not such a, you know, a poo-poo about it, that they're willing to go. So I think we might start to see a shift in the number of women experiencing menopausal systems symptoms as these kids who are now in their 20s start moving into their 40s because they've just all they've grown up with it they know they should be in the gym they know they have to lift weights so it's unfortunately it's our generation right now who were kind of left out in the cold I played university sports so I had exposure to that but it was not very common for women to be in the gym lifting heavy weights it was kind of ew why do you want to look like a man like I mean it was Oh, get over it. And I like, I mean, I'm happy to keep banging the drum that you will not get big and bulky lifting weights and, <laughs> yeah. and neither can you get long lean muscles. There's all sorts of things going on out there. But what you can do is, um, well, you tend to get a little bit smaller when you do weights, if you, especially if you're holding on to some fat because um, it's just structurally different and it's a nice, compact, tight little substance that really looks good in a pair of jeans but but, <laughs> but so one of the things I don't know if you have the answer to this and I actually struggle to find it in the research paper one of the reasons is I I find research papers very overwhelming after a while you know it's just um yeah. I after I've read the, I go to the conclusion and then I, I you know reverse engineer that's usually how most people read them <laughs> How do we actually know why these particular symptoms, the VMS, these um, vasomenopausal um, menopausal symptoms, the motor symptoms, sorry, are the ones that are affected by the, if you have better limb body mass, do we know why those are not the other symptoms we get? Is there like any correlation that we can find? There, the seems to be the closest link we could find was in oxidative stress. So estrogen is an antioxidant. So it protects you from all the oxidative stress that's flowing around. So, so as you get older and you lose your estrogen, you lose that protective effect. And so the oxidative stress flowing through you seems to have uh, impairment on the, what is called the thermoregulatory center, which 
narrows the, your um, body temperature zone, which is comfortable. So you have, instead of being able to go from, you know, 95 to 99 uh, in your body without too much, you know, distress, now it's shrunk. So the slightest change in your internal body temperature sends you into hot flashes. Um, so they're starting to see that connection. It's very difficult to study, obviously. Uh, somebody has actually invented this weird little suit that they can put on a woman and make her exercise until she gets a hot flash, and then they can check the vasodilation going on on the skin. And it's, But obviously, you can't do mass studies with one suit and getting people to wear these ridiculous things in, this, in the laboratory. So, Do we also see as we go through menopause an actual drop in our body temperature slightly as well that might? Yes, which is impact. why often yeah. women get the cold feet and you start getting you know, cold hands all the time, which is a new symptom for some. And lots of women don't realize that's a symptom of menopause. Yeah. They just think, mm -hmm. oh, my hands are always cold. I'm always cold. So, yeah, that's it's difficult to line up all those things and say, this is all because your estrogen is dropping and your progesterone. Oh, well, I actually in Canada started getting renoids because of the, the cold hands, cold feet side of things, like quite symptom, quite bad. Yeah. I'm yeah. so happy I'm in Texas because of the warmth. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, so, but, but so we, we know that we know the, the shift in that, that body thermatic, um, um, system and like the, our body temperature drop in, but the lean muscle mass seems to have some type of protective element to it. Is that what happens? Yeah. So what it's doing is it's protecting you um, in your oxidative stress, surprisingly. So um, lean muscle mass uh, kind of creates a system, go uh, uh, process going on in your body that protects you from antioxidants that your estrogen used to do. So, I mean, muscle will also uh, attract as much, much estrogen out of you as it can because it has estrogen receptors. So yeah. the more you have, the more it can um, steal out of you, which is great. But it, it, it's not well studied because nobody's actually made this connection yet. So I'm hoping now we can start moving this forward and get a real firm grasp on why this is going on. Is that maybe your next baby? Yes. Is that what that is? <laughs> yes, I'm hoping. You're I'm, hoping so. Yeah. I love the idea of that because there definitely has to be like some, like some connection to that because, and you saying because of the oxidative stress, I mean, um, we also know that women who have higher levels of cortisol really struggle with hot mm -hmm. flashes um, chronically, and but we also know that how um, exercise can can help with help with those levels as well, like to, to reduce those. So there has to how all has to be interconnected. Yeah, it has to be. And then um, and then specifically, resistance training doesn't tend to raise those stress levels as high as going through some of the more traditional um, cardio exercises can, you know, like there's that type of body, um, physical response that happens after exercise. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, most like the, the core, like people who like to go for a run and if you love to run, that's, that's great. But forcing yourself to go out for a run just increases your cortisol levels, which isn't really helping you. Whereas, you know, a 15, 20, 25 minute intense weight workout, it, your cortisol is going to go up. It has to, to, you know, combat the stress of, of working out, but it's not only the same 15, levels. It's yeah. not the same levels. And then no. it comes down right away. And then you're yeah. into muscle repair and you're, you know, using up some of that extra energy you've got, which is just far better for your system. They're seeing than moderate cardio. Yeah, and and I'm a, a massive um, proponent of like less like the low intensity steady state cardio because of the emotional component that has, but it's keeping the heart rate in a in a in a low to moderate range that really can help stabilize. So this is what this is when it comes down to this um, question that's constantly being asked. Well, how can I read my body signals? How do I know when too much is too much? And how how do I know when my body's too stressed to work out? And it's a very different, like you said, it's a very difficult question to answer because we don't really know, and it's a very unique, singular experience for every woman. But you know, like for myself, for example, like today I went to the doctors. Like I actually went to the, get, and I had my blood um, pressure tested. Now I was like, Jesus, I feel tired today. And I was going to go to the gym beforehand, and I was like, you know what? I actually don't think 
it's a good idea today. I just, and my blood pressure was 90 over 50. It was pretty low. And she's like, Jesus, aren't you tired? And I'm like, I'm pretty tired today. I don't know why. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know why. I normally felt quite energized, but it was like, I didn't need to have that blood pressure test to realize that I'm pretty exhausted. And, yeah. and, and chances are, if I was to exercise at like capacity that raises my cortisol, it's going to hang around a bit longer than I want it to. And I, I don't feel like I could recover as well. But that's took me years to get that like understanding. Uh, do you have any sort of advice to women that really are trying to answer that question themselves? Yeah, it's hard. And I tell my clients just, just to start with movement. Like, if we all, you know, have packed schedules and at this point in our life, you know, we're dealing with, we're still dealing with kids. You know, some people are dealing with aging parents who say you're being pulled in so many ways. So I tell them, start with your movement. Just go for a walk. Just try to de-stress that way. Like the exercise is great, but if you, if you're pushing yourself when you're super tired and you're already fatigued, it's not going to help you. You're not going to work at a very good intensity and it's just going to increase your cortisol. So I tell them, you know what, if it's, if you're just feeling tired today, just take the dog for a walk, just increase your movement. It'll help just keep the blood moving, keep your circulation going, get some oxygen. And if they can get outside, I think it just helps a lot. Like even when it's minus six outside and we have horror frost all over the trees to say, it still feels better to go out and breathe and then come back and say, oh, okay, now I, I can deal. Because stress, I think, is probably the biggest issue that menopausal women have. The biggest issue. Oh, yeah. When I talk about, like, the four pillars that I coach, you know, I've obviously got nutrition, exercise, and, like, the positivity, the psych psychological aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But de-stressing, stress management is, like, number one because it – impacts everything, the whole home endocrine system in your body, yeah. all your hormones are impacted by stress. And so like, if you want to work out that day and you're feeling like crap, do something that de-stresses you and see if you can get to a state where you feel a little bit more centered and ready to, ready to move. And then yeah, start with some movement. But here we go, right? So we've got all these women that are listening going, oh, this is awesome. I know now that the thing that I'm going to start doing is resistance training because I actually just want to start feeling better. I potentially have 10 years of this shit and I just want to start <laughs> feeling good. So I'm going to start looking at my nutrition and, you know, I want to start exercising. Yeah. I mean, and I can answer this question too, but I just want like want, want your, your viewpoint on this. What, sure. Where should they start? What should they do? And, and like, and how often? Uh, I suggest they start with just three times a week for 20 minutes. And, you know, they don't need to be lifting in you know, a bodybuilder split. They don't need to be doing specific body parts. They need to be doing full body, heavy movements, like pick up heavy things and move them kind of idea. It doesn't have to be, and I like them to move quickly. So I, I don't want them doing, you know, a bodybuilders, you know, do 10 reps and sit for a minute. That's not helpful for them. So they need to lift heavy things, do it quickly, get through your workout, um, you know, basic, basic movements. They don't like to squat, but you know what? You're squatting all day long. You're picking up the groceries, you're picking up the kids, you're moving the dog, you're moving the vacuum cleaner. So it's a movement they need to do to strengthen their back because the number of women who say, my back hurts, like I hurt my back, you say, we need to get more functional. So I, I start with, you know, just kind of basic, basic, basic uh, squat, learning to squat properly, learning to bend over properly. Like how many of us have hurt our back reaching into the back seat of the car? Like it's crazy. So just strengthening with big, heavy movements, like just like your tired deadlift the other day. That was great. So you just pick up a heavy object and move it. Well, if anyone's not listening, you want to over to my Instagram feed. I do this. Um, I actually do run because I'm at the stage where my running doesn't raise my cortisol because I've done it for that long. I can do a 5K run and still be in a very easy, um, I'm relaxed doing it. Um, and I also need it just to get away from the kids. I'm literally running away from my family. That's why. I <laughs> yeah. But the, on this one day that I do, I run 
behind where my kids play rugby and there's a football training facility there that I just, I literally steal into. And they have this man-made hill and I do hill sprints, which again, are great for that, like anaerobic, metallic, um, metallic, uh, metabolic, um, <laughs> threatening, yeah, metallic, that's the taste of my mouth. I've got, <laughs> got the, uh, the metabolic demand. But then there's this massive 400 pound tire and every week I try and flip it. And it won't move. It's just a total bitch of a, a thing. So I've started deadlifting it because it must be around 200 pounds, I would suspect. You know, I'm only, yeah. but it feels so good. And it's like, it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to get it. But, you know, I love this approach and it's identical, identical in every respect to how I coach women as well who want to start because I'm like, you have one thing. Squatting isn't just about using your legs. If you squat, say a goblet squat, it's the best exercise to get the core engaged, to get the lats engaged, to activate your feet, to just feel like the whole body doing something. And it doesn't even need to be difficult, but you're going to re- increase your range of motion. Your mobility is going to improve, injury prevention, blah, 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 blah. There's so many benefits yeah, to it. Exactly. As, and now... You're going to help your menopausal symptoms. So yeah. well, what the fuck are you waiting for? Just go and pick something up and squat it. But I also love like the, the moving quickly thing. Exactly. Right? And I think like I tell women, because everybody thinks they need to, to stop and, you know, you know, recover. It's like, no, you go until you can't go any longer. And then you start again. You don't like you stop and catch your breath. Okay, go like start pick right where you left off and keep going. And just 15 or 20 minutes is all you have to do if you're moving and you're lifting heavy. And it's, I know it's a big shift for a lot of women because I still see them in the gym too, right? They're, they've got 10 pound dumbbells and they're doing, you know, five bicep curls and then they put them down and they talk to their friend for a minute and a half and then they pick them up again and say, like, I, I appreciate you're there, but let's be more efficient with why you're there and actually get some results because you see a lot of them come in day after day after day and they, they're not changing. They're not getting great results, but you say, I'm, I'm glad you're there, but let me just suggest some, you try something different and just, and, you know. and then also we, we know, and I mean, you, you, it's very much talked about in the research as well, just the other benefits of lean body mass moving forward into old age, right? Yeah. Or our second far, half of our life for, for chronic diseases, right? I mean, we, the biggest killer of women is heart disease, yeah. cardiovascular diseases. We know yeah. one in two women will have a hip fracture over the age of 55 one in two women it's insane we need to have that skeletal support and um my my wish is that like i have every woman with a like a a strength program like in their second half of their life purely for quality of life absolutely yeah i mean even uh, you know bone mineral density you say the best thing you can do is lift weights you by the time you're 25, your body has stopped storing calcium in your bones. It's all you can do after the age of 25, taking calcium supplements is going to help a little, but lifting heavy weights is going to help the most. So you've got to do it. You've got to do it, yeah. Okay, so we've come to the end of the interview, but is there anything else that you'd like to sort of add add to this? Just to get Because I love the idea of giving women lots of takeaways. That's the whole point of this podcast, you know, and I love that you told them, just start with you tw- three times, 20 minutes a week, moving something heavy quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything else they can be focusing on? I, I like them to focus on the, the big dial movers, right? So don't be worried about, should I have a, a post-workout shake? You know, focus on one thing at a time. Get your three workouts in every week. Lift heavy things and then keep your movement up. Keep moving, like just walking, not stressful, not power walking, not just out for a nice leisurely stroll. Keep moving and then worry about, you know, I could probably add a little bit more green, but don't like stressing about your diet is stress. Like stop stressing about your diet. Eat moderately, you know, enjoy your life. And then the, you know, just those three components and just focus on the big stuff. Like, I mean, if we get bombarded with information about, well, you know, don't eat after eight o'clock or you have to do intermittent fasting or you have to do keto. It's like, no, just do what works for you. Cause figuring out what works for you is the hardest part. I mean, and we're all so different and, and I can tell somebody what to do, but 
they have to really sit down and figure out what works for them. That's great advice. Yeah, I like to talk about it as of them like having a menopause toolkit. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's there's items in there that you're gonna need at certain times and other times not so much, right? But yeah. but the but the big main components will always be valid and will always help you. Um and so that's great advice. Thank you, Roseanne. This is going to be such a great episode for people to tune into. Um, and I'm so excited about the research. Like, I'm so excited. It's just, <laughs> it's just what we need because there just isn't anything out there. It really is a struggle that's to right. find valid information. And so I think that this is hopefully just the start of something big. I hope so, too. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Amanda. Thank you so much. And tune in again next week, everyone. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the show. For more information on my services, head over to my website at fitandchips.com. That's like fish and chips, F-I-T-N-C-H-I-P-S.com. Or you can head over to my Fit and Chips Facebook page too. If you leave me a comment or if you contact me, I promise I'll do my best to respond to all of your questions. The views and advice expressed by myself in this show are not a substitute for conventional medical service. No information here should be interpreted as a medical diagnosis, treatment or prevention of any disease. If in any doubt, always go straight to your doctor. Take care. Love you. Bye.